So folks, I'd like to quickly let you know that the session happening in Conference Hall 2 right now, you're in Conference Hall 1, but the session happening in Conference Hall 2, which is the other session, is focused on sustainable and greener investing. That's led by Victor Wong and Hong Lee from UOB Asset Management, because you can actually do a lot more for the environment through investing the right way than just using less plastic bags or straws. So if you're interested in that, to find out more, you can head over to Conference Hall 2 right now. But here in Hall 1, folks, you've just learned to create a trading system for yourself. So what should you be buying? To help you diagnose what's best for your portfolio, we have Dr. Wealth himself, Mr. Alvin Chow, and also from the New Academy of Finance, Mr. Royston Tan. So Alvin, Royston? Over to you. I will like, let Royston start first, then I'll do my part. Royston, please. All right, uh, Royston here, and I hope that everyone can see my screen. This should not be a problem. Am I right? Okay, so then let's get, get started on the topic for today, which is basically how to build your portfolio in 2022. So I'll be actually going through some portfolio generation ideas. And after that, I'll hand it over to Alvin. So before I actually get started, all right, uh, just a very quick introduction of myself. My name is Royston, and I'm actually the founder of New Academy of Finance. And before actually starting off this website, I have actually had more than 10 years of experience in the finance industry predominantly as both a buy as well as a sell side analyst in the stock market covering the industrial the oil and gas market, right? Uh, which is pretty hot in today's context, as well as the industrial sector. So I left the industry probably sometime in uh, 2019 and set up New Academy of Finance with the goal of actually bringing personal finance and investing knowledge to the masses. So for those who have yet to actually check out the website, do actually drop over to New Academy of Finance, all right? So without further ado, let's get started on today's agenda. I'll be covering two areas, which is basically addressing the uncertainties that we have, that we are seeing right now. So there's a lot of uncertainties that we are seeing in today's context. That's going to be the first part of the session. And for the second part, we will be highlighting, or I'll be highlighting a couple of uh, stocks for considerations for you guys as well. All right. But do know that all these are basically uh, for educational purposes and not really a recommendation for you guys to be buying and selling the stocks mentioned in this uh, current presentation. So please do your own due diligence work. Okay, so before I actually get started on the content proper, just a quick quote from Mr. Warren Buffett himself. And he has actually mentioned that the future is never clear. You pay a very high price in the stock market for a cheery consensus uncertainty actually is the friend of the buyer of long-term value. So today, if you actually do have a long-term horizon, you will actually would want or welcome uncertainty, okay? Because that actually allows you the opportunity to be buying stocks as well as assets on the cheap. So with that being said, I would say that 2020 is definitely a year, all right, uh, that is filled with uncertainty. So we have started off on a pretty volatile footing and I would expect that the rest of the year to be equally eventful. And most of you would probably already know by now, you know, whatever that's happening with regards to the Russia and Ukraine war, without getting into the political front, just in terms of the impact that it has on us, you know, in terms of, you know, pump prices, I guess that, you know, that's hitting the headlines almost every day. So you guys, you know, especially for drivers, you already have felt that impact. But at the same point of time, other commodities such as, you know, the soft commodities, rice, grains, and whatnot, is also creeping up. And I, I would say that at due time, you'll probably also feel that impact. You know, uh, when you realize that, you know, when you go to the uh, shopping uh, the, the supermarket and realize that, you know, all the products that you're looking to buy, your daily products, daily necessities are, got, are, more, are getting increasingly expensive. So that's going to be something I would expect to happen if not already happened uh, at this current juncture. So inflation has been the buzzword and that buzzword has, you know, slowly moved from the theme of being transitory towards now that it's a little bit more sustained. And um, there's potential that inflation could actually trend higher versus expectations. And the Fed has also come out to say that, hey, you know what? 
you know, we are, they, they did not admit outright that they are wrong, you know, in terms of the transitory kind of uh, saying just a few months back, but now they are prepared to actually raise rates pretty aggressively moving forward. And that's basically to avoid runaway inflation. So in their view, they believe that if inflation really gets out of hand, that's really going to be problematic. And uh, Fed Chairman, Mr. Powell have already stepped out to say that they are prepared to be raising rates pretty aggressively in today's context. And what I learned over the past decade is not to fight the Fed, all right? Not to fight the Fed in that uh, area. So if they are looking to raise rates pretty aggressively, this is something I would say you have got to be mindful about. And last but not least, of course, there's going to be the chatters of dreaded stagflation. So stagflation is basically a scenario not seen over the past five decades. Okay, so for most of us, we probably will not have experienced it. So basically, it's an environment whereby we realize that all the prices around us are increasing, but yet at the same point of time, we are finding it difficult. To, uh, diffi uh, we, we, we do have difficulty finding a job, for example. All right, uh, the economy is slowing down pretty significantly. So that's actually what happens in the US all the way back in the 1970s. And for the very first time, we are already hearing market chatters that we might be facing this kind of scenario moving forward. So having said that, you know, there's definitely a lot of uncertainty in 2022. So probably in your mind at this time, you are probably wondering, you know, some of the questions that you might have in today's context. First, are commodity prices expected to keep rising? So we know that commodity prices have been rising already. You know, even, even prior to the uh, Russia-Ukraine crisis, prices have already been creeping up. But because of that wall issue, you know, it basically gives it a bump up. So the big question is, are commodity prices expected to keep rising? So that's one uh, big question that you might have. And uh, how to actually cope with rising rates? You know, what are actually the sectors? What are the industries to be looking at if rates are really going to be shooting higher? Next, inflation. What if it becomes an environment whereby it's stagflationary? All right, so that's basically, I would say, a nightmare scenario for most of us. How should we actually position our portfolio? All right. Uh, and we and some people might say, oh, just, just put in cash, huh? you know, because everything is so uncertain. But in a stagflation environment, you know, uh, you know, inflation is also running pretty high. So essentially, if you're all in cash, uh, you're, you're actually losing money, so to speak. So that's not an ideal scenario as well. So what particular sector should you be looking at in a stagflationary environment? And last but not least, I also like to talk a little bit on whether or not the, it's the worst over for China. So that's also something that you guys might, uh, a big question that you guys might have in your mind as well. So I'll just be briefly covering these few areas. So starting off with commodities, are we too late? So I would just like to show this chart. So I've got uh, students as well as friends asking me, hey, Royston, you know, are we already too late in the commodities cycle? But I'd like to bring your attention to this chart over here, which actually shows that, yes, over the past couple of months, there's actually a big uh, jump in terms of the commodity index, the Bloomberg Commodity Index. Um, but if you were to actually go all the way back, you know, and uh, see that the peak was actually back prior, just prior to the GFC. So sometime in uh, 2008, 2007, that's when, you know, we actually had uh, the Bloomberg Commodity Index at a much higher level. So today, if you ask me whether or not we have more upside to go, I would say that yes, potentially that could be, all right, on an inflation adjusted basis, we are not at that level yet. Potentially, you know, there could be a next uh, bull cycle for the uh, commodity segment. And again, uh, moving on to the chart on the right, the diagram on the right, basically you are able to see that compared to stocks, right? Compared to stocks, the stocks to commodity ratio has been trending higher for the last decade. So what that means is that at the end of the day, stocks, it's uh, more pricey as compared to commodities, all right? When it's coming down, all right? So that's more of a deflationary environment. So we can see that, you know, uh, moving forward, uh, for or at least for the last decade, commodities has been unloved compared to stocks. So, Definitely, you know, uh, if we are looking at an environment whereby inflation is trending higher, and if you're asking me, is there more upside for commodities? I would say definitely so, as compared to stocks. 
Now, the next question then is, okay, if there's uh, more upside to commodities, should we be chasing whatever that we are seeing at this current juncture whereby the commodity prices have been skyrocketing like crazy for some of these uh, asset classes? And I'll say that, you know, uh, generally, I would, uh, I would say that the long-term fundamentals for commodities, I would say is still sound, especially on some of these metals like copper, for example. I think the long-term fundamentals are still sound, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you should be looking to chase the hype. And if the share price of, say, oil have appreciated from $80, $90 not too long ago, all the way to $140 within a short period of time, you should definitely expect a uh, pullback. All right, so a pullback. So at, at, at this current juncture, you know, my advice is not so much to actually be chasing the hype, but how then to position yourself to ride the commodities cycle. For me personally, my preferred choice is actually to look at some of these commodity companies, all right, that's going to be generating lots of free cash flow. That's going to be benefiting from this commodities upcycle. So these companies are still, I would say, some of them are still under the radar. The prices might have already been running for the commodity side, but on the company side, some of them you know, are still not showing that kind of results. But the truth is that if asset prices continues to remain high, ultimately these commodity companies will benefit in terms of generating higher free cash flow and at the end of the day, being able to pay a higher dividend amount to shareholders, do more buybacks and all these corporate actions will ultimately translate to better price performance in my view. So that's something which I think it's better for investors to actually be looking at as compared to, let's say, um, getting into futures. And of course, the more sophisticated uh, investors and traders can do that. But I would say for the man in the street, I think this would potentially be a better option you know, to be looking at some of these better run or well-run comedy companies that will be a key beneficiary of higher free cash flow. So that's on the commodity side, all right? Next, how fast will rate hike be? So the question is no longer about whether the Fed will be raising rate. It's really about how fast the Fed is going to raise rates. And the previous expectations is for the Fed to raise rates to be somewhere around the 2% region by the end of 2022, largely because of the Russia-Ukraine war likely going to impact global economy on the downside. All right, so they don't want to be too aggressive. But recently, okay, right, um, Mr. Powell have actually come out and said that, hey, you know what? You know, we are actually prepared to raise rates more aggressively if we are seeing that inflationary pressures is still there. So what is going to happen in that kind of scenario? So there's going to be definitely some pressure on the stock market. The market is going to be spooked if rates are rising too fast. But at the same point of time, there's going to be some sectors, some industries that's going to be benefiting from higher rates. All right, some sector of uh, the stocks that could be potential beneficiaries. And of course, there's going to be some laggards. So I'll cover on the beneficiary sites first. So very straightforward, I would say banks and financial institutions, they are going to be the ones that is benefiting from high interest rate. I think this is pretty clear cut. But of course, there's going to be a caveat, which I'll highlight to you at the end of my presentation. All right, something to look out for for the bank and financial institutions. Second one will be companies with low debt. Again, even in a rising interest rate environment, companies whereby they are not heavily leveraged, heavily geared, they don't have to worry that much in terms of rising rates potentially crimping their operations. And potentially, they could benefit in the form of taking over market share from some of their competitors who are heavily geared and basically crumble under the rising rate environment and they are able to take over their market share. So these companies would potentially be able to capitalize on that opportunity. So I'm not saying that their share price will not be impacted, all right? but these companies could, uh, that there could be better value at the end of the day for looking at this kind of companies. And the third category will be value stocks. And this is already happening. Value for, for the longest of the last decade, value stocks have been shunned. You know, their, their growth counterparts has been the one that is shining all the time. But I would say over the last couple of years, or at least last year, starting from the second half of last year, again, value stocks is slowly outperforming their growth counterpart. And that's where potentially, you know, they could continue to outperform growth stocks in a rising rates environment. So these are the three key categories simplified that could be potentially beneficial in a rising rate environment. How about the laggards? 
So the laggards, as I mentioned, of course, on the downside will be highly geared companies, those which are highly geared, you know, lots of uh, debt, essentially dependent on low interest rates borrowing to survive. These are the companies that might not be able to survive if, let's say, the banks pull back on their borrowings for them. Second category will be growth stocks. Uh, as I mentioned already, I would say that value stocks will be the preferred one over growth stocks in a rising rate environment. And the last asset category will be bonds. And we know the inverse relationship between bonds and interest rates. And bonds typically have been suffering, I would say, since the start of this year. And today, if you have a um, portfolio structure, a 60-40 portfolio structure, 60% on equities, 40% on bonds, and your 60% of equities is mainly on growth stocks, this portfolio is not going to protect you from any market sell-off, all right? Because I would say that in a market sell-off as a result of rising rates, your bonds assets will be equally hard hit. So this is uh, my view on the rate hike and where you should be looking to position some of your portfolios in this kind of assets. So that will be rate hike. Next, moving on to the worst nightmare. And I term this as the worst nightmare because this is something that most people do not yet talk about. All right, the stagflationary environment because yes, we are talking a lot about inflation, but the expectation is that most uh, of the economies are still expected to be growing pretty healthily, two, 3% moving forward. But what if, what if, you know, that growth is no longer evident and it's actually declining, all right? Negative growth, and that becomes a stagflationary environment. So that becomes uh, most of our worst nightmare. But how do we then look to position ourselves again? Like I mentioned again, even in the stagflationary environment, there's going to be certain asset classes that's going to benefit from it. And uh, I put this chart from Bank of America and they basically did an analysis on the different kind of assets uh, classes back in the uh, late 1960s, early 1970s, during the hyperinflationary environment, the stagflationary environment in the US, which are the sectors that actually did pretty well. And generally, the consensus is that, okay, materials, commodities, they are the ones that is doing pretty well. Okay, so that's uh, going to be good. Healthcare, pharma companies, they are also going to be pretty resilient. And for me, the third one is basically consumer staple stocks. And not just any consumer staple stocks, basically those with pricing power. Because in a stagflationary environment whereby prices are rising fast, they are also going to be impacted by rising raw material costs. But for them, they are able to increase their selling prices on their products. And basically consumers like us would have to absorb it because we have to buy their products every single day. So we've got no choice. We just have got to pay up for it. And for them, essentially what that means is that their margins can be protected. And to them, a lot of uh, this kind of companies will do pretty well, even in a stagflationary environment. So today, if let's say we, 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 we do experience this nightmare scenario, I would say you have got to be prepared uh, to and position your portfolio better in this kind of asset classes. So that's for stagflation. And last but not least, I would like to actually highlight on China, which is also a topic that has been talked about a lot lately. So I'm not sure if you guys are actually aware that the Golden Dragons, which is basically the large cap, the blue chip China tech stocks, have actually witnessed a 75% drawdown from the start of 2021, Q1 of 2021, all the way to recent, uh, recent weeks. That drawdown magnitude has been 75% and it rivals that of the tech bubble in 2000. All right, so we have talked about how bad the tech bubble was for a lot of this kind of tech companies, but we don't really hear a lot about, you know, how bad some of these uh, China stocks or how cheap they have become. We probably know, all right, we probably know, but definitely there's still going to be a lot of uncertainty. And I mentioned already, uncertainty is basically... Uh, something good for a long-term investor because that is where you are able to be buying assets on the chip. So if you have bought into all this big cap uh, China tech stocks at a peak back in quarter one, 2021, I can definitely feel your pain, all right? Because I also do have some positions in them. And a drawdown of 75% is something probably we would not have thought about being realistic for a company, blue chip company like Alibaba and, and Tencent. But I mean, it did in fact happen. So for those who are vested at the top, definitely you're feeling, uh, if you're not already out, 
you know, definitely you, you, the, the feeling is not good. But for those who are looking to get into or finding opportunities in the market, my question to you is, what are you waiting for at this current juncture? All right, what are you waiting for at this current juncture? As I mentioned already, yes, definitely there's still a lot of uncertainties out there with regards to uh, China's regulation, you know, whether or not a lot of these China companies listed on the US will get delisted, etc., their involvement in, in Russia and whatnot. Yes, there's always going to be uncertainty, but definitely at this current juncture, if you're getting it at the current juncture, the risk to reward is definitely much better skewed to your favor. And if you have got a long-term horizon, I would say that you will probably do pretty well, especially if you look at valuation from the valuation standpoint. All right, we are not buying into these companies. Yes, they're for a lot, but we are not buying them when they're still expensive. All right, we are buying them at, at a negative standard, uh, negative uh, one standard deviation, all right, compared to the uh, forward PE relative to the world stock market. So it's definitely cheap on this current context. So just fruit for thought on whether or not you should be looking. For me personally, I think that this is an opportunity uh, because the risk reward actually is looking pretty good. So with that, we have, I've, I'm done with my first portion. I will now move on to the second portion, which is basically to highlight a few of these uh, Singapore stocks for every occasion. Uh, as you know, uh, just, just basically for ideas generation, okay? So like I mentioned, this is basically for educational purposes and not a recommendation to be buying or selling this stock. So please do your own due diligence. So I'll be highlighting three stocks. One on the value side, which is generally more long-term basis. Dividend side, again, more long-term basis. And the third one will be a momentum play, which is more short-term in nature. So capitalize on the trending momentum of this particular counter. So for our value stock, uh, the one that I have in mind, it's actually Semcorp Industries. So for those, uh, most of you are probably not aware, and I just now highlighted that I was an analyst previously, and all I guess analysts previously, and basically Semcorp Industries is a company that I've been covering for many years. And uh, the, the, the issue with Semcorp Industries for the longest of time when I tried to market it, right, when I tried to market it to funds to buy into them, is basically, you know, the, the, the fact that they still have the marine arm. They still have the marine arm, which is basically dragging down their profitability. And of course, it's not being seen as, as green energy to a lot of uh, ESG funds. So with the divestment of Samcorp Marine now, you know, as a standalone entity, you, uh, utility company, they definitely appeal a lot more to uh, more funds, especially to ESG funds. So that's uh, key point number one. Key point number two, I would say is that most of the kitchen sinking is done. What do I mean by that? If you are somebody who actually follows Semcorp Industries, you'll realize that every single quarter, they would have impairments done on their assets. Right? Basically, the assets are not performing up to standards. They basically have to write down the value in their balance sheet. So every quarter, without doubt, there's going to be impairments. But with the new uh, management actually coming in uh, late last year, so his job is basically to kitchen sink everything so they can get to start afresh in 2022 without having to deal with all this uh, lower quality assets moving forward. So I would say is that moving forward, I do expect the impairments uh, for Samcorp Industries to be a bit, a, a, a lot lesser. So in terms of reported earnings, it's definitely going to be much stronger. So that's something to look out for as well. Key point number three, potential monetization from the sale of their India's conventional assets. So they have been looking to go green from brown to green. And one of the key area that they have been looking to is basically to dispose of their India's um, power plant assets for the longest of time. So this increasingly likely that they are looking, they, they, they potentially can actually uh, dispose of their assets moving forward. And if they uh, manage to do so at a good price, that could also be a key catalyst for this particular company in 2022. So those are the three key points generally, you know, in a nutshell of why I think that this is a potential value play. All right, it's, it's not really expensive. I, I'm not looking at the, the various price earnings ratio and stuff like that. But in my mind, I think that this company is cheap enough based on these three key points. Of course, there's going to be some short-term risk, which is the impact of rising raw material costs, such as coal. But a lot of them, you know, have... Uh, contracts which is passed through, meaning that even if coal prices are rising, they are able to, to actually pass through the higher coal prices to, at the end of the day, to their consumers. All right, so that's 
uh, company number one, Samcom Industries on the value side. On the dividend side, I'm looking at REITs and specifically Ascenders REITs. So I'm not sure. I, I believe that a lot of you guys are probably um, lovers of uh, REITs or basically have some form of investment in REITs. And, but they have been a asset class that's unloved for quite a while, for the last two years. They have been underperforming for the last two years. In the past, blue chip REITs used to be trading at a yield of 2-3%. Uh, that's pretty low. But now, a lot of these blue chip REITs are actually yielding in excess of 5%, and I think that that's something pretty attractive as well. So Ascenders REITs, for example, have a dividend yield of uh, analyzed dividend yield of more than 5%, so that's definitely an interesting component on the yield segment. Uh, but beyond that, in terms of its asset quality, asset class, also I think that it actually does hold a resilient portfolio of new economy assets, which includes business space, logistic data centers, assets which come high or dry, we'll probably need it in the coming decade or so. Key point number three, well-managed debt profile with 80% fixed debt. So even if, if interest rates were to rise, for the short term at least, they are able to manage their their interest rates pretty well because most of their debt are really fixed. So they won't get impacted that badly. But of course, on a longer term basis, that's where the, 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 the risk comes in. If you're not able to actually raise their rental faster than that of uh, the rising debt cost, that's where it's going to eat into their margins. So that's, again, is something to be mindful about. So my prepared play for, for, for dividend, a dividend counter, it's Ascenders REITs. Next, moving on to momentum. Momentum, uh, I'm looking at sets limited. All right, sets limited. And one, this is basically a stop for the reopening. So Singapore reopening up its economy to tourists. And this is basically one particular counter that's exposed to the travel sector. And for me, I think this is also quite important. Point number two, a lot of um, these airlines that we are looking at or uh, reopening place like Comfort Delgo, for example, all right, um, on, the, on the transport sites, they could be actually impacted by rising fuel costs, which is what is happening at this current juncture. But for SETS, the impact of rising fuel costs is not as significant as all these other companies or all these transport companies. So they could be a better, a better, better player to ride that upside. And for me, you know, in terms of momentum, I'm looking at the chart and I'm seeing, I'm using this proprietary uh, trading chart called Traders GPS. And it's actually showing me that, you know, the right, the, the momentum for this counter is potentially rising, right? It's potentially rising. So I'm getting an indicator over here that, you know, this stock could be looking pretty interesting. And if the breakout is actually confirmed, you know, that could mean higher upside. So to me, I think that is a momentum play that you guys might potentially want to consider. Short-term risk is, of course, the U-term of policy towards uh, tightening restrictions. So we have been reopening or we're looking to reopen pretty soon. Uh, if there's going to be an increase in terms of COVID-19 cases again, for whatever reasons, potentially there could be a U-turn in terms of policy, not something that everybody wants to see. But you know, if that happens, then of course, this kind of stocks will actually take a hit again. So with that, uh, key takeaways before I hand it over to Alvin. Macro picture, we are looking at a rising rate environment, potentially sustained inflation, and perhaps slowing growth moving forward. All right, so this is not something that we are expecting at this current juncture, but something that we have got to be mindful about. There are still opportunities, and I would say that there are these few sectors are basically where the opportunities might be. Commodities, materials, generally, I'm still positive in a short-term basis. Uh, as well as uh, on some of the long-term fundamentals of um, certain asset classes in this area. For example, like I mentioned earlier, uh, copper, for example, is something that I'm pretty positive about. But having said that, you know, don't blindly chase the hype. So if you're seeing that the asset price have already risen so much, 30-40% over a short period of time, you've got to be prepared for a significant pullback, right? But Look at it on a long-term basis. If you are still believing in this particular asset classes outperforming because of fundamental reasons, that's a reason to be positioned for the long term. Financial institutions, definitely going to be a beneficiary of rising rates environment, but be wary of non-performing loans rising. So this is a caveat. So in the event whereby the economy really slows down significantly, potentially we might have a problem with non-performing loans. So this is something to be mindful about. Consumer staples, uh, look at those with pricing power, as I mentioned. And last but not least, China stocks, 
if you are not already in it, I think now could potentially be a good time to bottom fish. I'm not saying that the, 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 the end is here. All right, no one can really predict whether the end is here, but getting into China stocks at this current juncture, if you don't already have an existing exposure, the risk reward is definitely a lot stronger as compared to a few months or even one year ago. Okay, so with that, I've come to the end of my portion. Let me hand over to Alvin, all right, to take over his segment. Thank you, Royston. Okay, let me just quickly go through my part. So hi, I'm Elvin. I'm the CEO of Dr. Wealth. I'm also an SGX Academy trainer. And uh, I'll just zoom straight to the individual stock, okay? <laughs> Since probably that's what most of you are interested in. And uh, uh, together with Royston, we discuss and we agree that each of us give three. Uh, one value stock, one dividend stock, and one momentum stock. So I start with a momentum stock. So here I give you a backdrop about the inflation or even a possibility of a stagflation that's going to come up, right? So uh, one of the commodity that really went up a lot was coal, right? So coal went up uh, about 5x uh, since a year ago in terms of the price. And uh, coal prices, on one hand, it may not look like something that, oh, it's not significant right? because like, for example, developed countries like Singapore, we don't actually uh, buy coal to burn uh, for energy. But uh, in China, it's a different story, right? Coal is a primary source of energy. And uh, China is also the largest country in terms of energy consumption because they are like the factory of the world, right? Everything they make for the world. So the factories are humming along and burning all this coal um, uh, as, as we speak. So when coal prices go up, that means that uh, uh, you know, a lot of other costs of uh, production may be cascaded and passed down to consumers. So that is what Bobby Royston talked about, right? We may see uh, increasing prices in our everyday items as we go along. So how can we then uh, look at coal to benefit from it? So one company in Singapore that's this is called Joe Energy. Uh, this is the ticker, RE4. So they are a coal mining company that is in Indonesia. And uh, there used to be a time where Australia has been exporting coal to China, but due to some geopolitical issues, uh, Australia stopped exporting and Indonesia became a major exporter of coal. And that's why this geo energy became a very big beneficiary of that. And you can see that their, their uh, average, average price and their sales volume has been going up. Okay. And this is, a, this is the average selling price, huh? right? It has been going up, going up, going up. Right, because of the commodity pool run as well. So it's been happening since like uh, 3Q2020. That's quite a way back then. And we're talking about 5X from a year ago uh, in terms of coal prices. So it is good from there because the cost of digging up the coal is the same. But now they get to sell a lot more because the market price has went up. And that contributes to a lot of the profits that they are seeing right now. And uh, revenue has jumped 159% from a year ago. Okay, And their net profits have also uh, almost doubled. Right, and uh, their free cash flow also started to be very, very uh, uh, positive. I would say, right, compared to the the capex, the amount of free cash flow they generated is like more than fifty, you know, sixty times. Okay, their their cap uh, the capex that they spend on, so um, they are in a very good position because of all this commodity run, and of course the share price have gone up a lot. All right, uh, and. Some of you might be thinking, oh, so high already. Why would you still want to like talk about this stock? Okay, so uh, it depends on your strategy, right? Like the previous session, they were talking about uh, trend following, momentum kind of strategy. So this fits into that momentum profile, right? So if you are someone who is a momentum trader, uh, you, sh you are sure that the trend is still pretty much intact for this kind of company. And if some of the future quarters of geo energy results are going to be even better than currently, it will give some support to this momentum to go on further, right? So of course, we don't know when the trend will collapse, but um, uh, you know the trend followers always believe that the trend is your friend and you stay with the trend until the trend ends, right? Of course, you must know uh, when do you sell, and that is uh, one important part if you want to do this uh, uh, trend following kind of uh, uh, strategy, right? So if that's so, then some of these mining companies in Singapore may look interesting. Joe Energy is one. Uh, there's a couple of others like Fortress Minerals, all this, right? So I do think that uh, that's one area you can zoom in if you want to um, uh, treat the inflation theme. Then the uh, dividend stock I choose will be Sheng Xiong, right? As uh, Royston has said, consumer staples are the ones that 
will be very resilient through different economic cycle, whether is it boom, bust or what, people go to the supermarket to buy your daily necessity. Right? It's not like it's a recession, you stop buying toilet paper <laughs> or you stop buying uh, vegetables to eat, right? So it is very unlikely. Maybe you curtail on some of the more expensive items, but you still need to buy something, right? Your supplies from uh, the supermarket. And Xingxiong is the third largest supermarket in Singapore behind NTUC Fair Price and Dairy Farm. Dairy Farm runs your cold storage as well as your giant. Right. Um, uh, so this is one of a more resilient play, I would say. And the good thing is that relative to dairy farm, dairy farm is also listed in SGX, but the dairy farm is actually cutting dividends, right? The dividend per share is actually coming down, whereas the uh, Xingxiong dividends are actually rising. So in that sense, it shows you that uh, in terms of operations, uh, Xingxiong is a lot uh, stronger. Right, compared to dairy farm, maybe it is a conglomerate. It has a lot more businesses than just supermarkets. Uh, that may complicate things, right? Um, but generally, cutting dividends is not good for share prices. As you can see, dairy farm share prices have not done very well. Whereas uh, for Xingxiong, uh, it has uh, done well, especially during COVID. And uh, but the hype is sort of like over. I think people stop rushing to buy Xingxiong stock because. Uh, lockdowns are unlikely to happen. Not that it will totally be eliminated, but uh, it is unlikely because Singapore just announced about opening up. And trading around 4% yield with rising with potential rising dividend, your, that means that your yield on cost will go up. That means maybe if they increase the dividend next year, uh, the your, your share price that you buy this year is going to be locked, right? So um, next year they increase the DPS, then maybe your yield can go up to 5%, 6%, right? So as they keep rising the dividend, per share, your U1 cost will actually goes up. So this is one of the, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, kind of a dividend grower potentially uh, in the Singapore market. Okay. And of course, PM Lee talked about the reopening and after that speech, the stock market just went crazy in Singapore. And this is just a summary of uh, the impact to the relevant stocks. So basically is uh, what I call the tourism stocks. Uh, that's in the aviation, transport, hotel, F&B, retail, entertainment, because all these uh, sectors will start to see more tourist spending in them, right? So, uh, Ruston talked about SATS already, okay? So, it has gone up 5% that day, together with the other aviation stock, about 4%. Then your Comfort Delgo, 4%. Uh, SBS Transit, which is a subsidiary of Comfort Delgo, has also gone up 2%. The hotels have gone up about 2 to 6% in one day. Uh, all this is in, within a day. And f &B, uh, the, the smaller cap ones saw double digit, right? 26%, 20%, 19% because the eat out person, number of person can <laughs> expand to 10 now. And uh, I think that not just for tourists, but even the locals are probably going back to the restaurants for their gatherings, right? So f &B, uh, saw a much bigger gain than the rest. And of course, uh, shopping, entertainment, all these are, are, are the ones that will receive higher uh, revenue as tourists come, come and re, uh, visit Singapore. So the third stock that I want to talk about is uh, more like a value rebound, right? Uh, it's like Genting Singapore. So uh, Resort World Sentosa, it has hotels, it has casinos, it has a lot of F&B restaurants. And uh, this opening up is definitely good for them, right? And they have survived the worst time because COVID was really, really uh, damaging to the tourism sector. And yet their performance has been very resilient. So even in 2020, which the COVID happened, and then thereafter, the, the periodic lockdowns were still happening, they managed to generate profits. Okay, They were not in losses. And their cash flow was also positive. Right? And of course, there were some uh, government handouts as well uh, to help them. And their cash position was still pretty strong, three plus uh, billion uh, dollars in cash. So they have survived the worst time, which means the upside from here is more likely than the downside. And if we look at this figure, pre-COVID and the latest year results, right? pre-COVID, their gaming revenue is 1.6 billion. Now it's about half of what it is. So if let's say it goes back to pre-COVID levels, we are talking about 100% recovery in revenue and non-gaming revenue is even more. Right? Pre-COVID was about 800 million and now it's about 245 million. That's a 239% gap that they have to recover to pre-COVID levels. Of course, we're not, we are not sure whether you know, it will hit pre-COVID levels or higher or lower or how long does it take for this to happen. But uh, the way I see it, it is indeed a, a, a potential rebound from here. 
Okay, and of course, if you look at the the metrics, right? Uh, we look at the current versus the five year average. Huh? Uh, you you can see the PS is still higher than the five year average. P is still higher. Uh, price over cash flow is still higher. So it doesn't really look like a value stock. Okay, it looks like so expensive. P is fifty four. Right, the reason is because of uh, you know, they are they are operating a very depressed number. Okay, so this is a case where. Uh, metrics doesn't tell you the full story and uh, you need to estimate what the rebound will bring, right? So if let's say they double, right? Let's say the earnings double from where it is. That means your PE ratio will half to about 27. That's compared to 36 uh, X five years average, right? That is relatively cheaper. So I would still see it more like a value stock than anything, even though the metrics on the surface may tell you otherwise, all right? And it's all-time high is at $2.22. Now it's at $0.82. Cents, and one-year high is about $0.94. Cents, okay, so even from a technical viewpoint, uh, there is room right, for uh, improvement. Okay, and this is the blue chip we're talking about. It's a, a SDI component, if I'm not wrong. Okay, so in a nutshell, how to position, um, um, summarize for that three kinds of trades. So first is that momentum trade will still work on commodity-related ones. Uh, how long it can last, I'm not sure, right? That's why I put that short term. I think within the next few months, it should have some leaks to run. Uh, coal, palm oil, there's quite a number of palm oil stocks in Singapore. Uh, gold, uh, gold, I would like to highlight, is only lightly linked to the war, right? That is happening. It's not so much of the inflation. Um, uh, it's more on crises, right? So if let's say uh, the war persists, gold should continue to do well, right? Other than that, the rest of the community should have more uh, leaks to go. Then in terms of dividend stocks, I think consumer staples, right? Uh, one area to look at. Banks definitely because they benefit from the rate heights and banks give a lot of dividends and rising as well. For REITs, uh, likely I think you'll be muted in the short term uh, because interest rates are generally not as friendly to REITs due to the mortgage that they, they borrow on. So financing charges go up, their dividends goes down, right? So, uh, but I don't think it will be that bad. So it will be more, more like a uh, muted kind of performance, right? Neither up or down. Then Singapore reopening play for the intermediate term. And uh, I think hotel sector, aviation, FMB, transport, all have potential for higher uh, prices. Okay, so that is the end of my presentation. So let me just stop the share and we can move on to the questions. Okay, we can move on to the questions. Let me see. Right. Okay, first question that is very popular and voted up is about REITs because I think uh Royston, you talk about uh the uh what recommendation, not what your suggestion trade idea was uh ARIT, right? And yes, you yes. also talk about stagflation. Yes. So the question is how will REITs perform <laughs> during stagflation period? How do you link that two together? To be, to, be, to be really honest, right, if a stagflation period were to happen, and that's probably not the base case at this current juncture, that's probably more of the uh, bare, really bearish scenario. And if a stagflation environment really happens, then uh, REITs is probably also going to be one of those asset class that's going to get impacted on the downside. Uh, one is, of course, rising rates, and you have just highlighted as well, rising rates really not very good for asset-heavy uh, classes like REITs. If they are not able to actually raise their rents much faster than uh, the rising rates of their cost of debt. And in a stagflationary environment, that's where whereby the economy is slowing down pretty significantly. So you don't expect to be able to actually be able to uh, garner higher rental. So definitely, I would think that in that kind of environment, REITs will also potentially suffer, so to speak. Huh? But uh, we are probably not looking at that scenario, just need to be prepared but probably not looking at the scenario at that current juncture. If stagflation really were to rear its ugly head, then I would say uh, REITs could potentially be one of those that will be impacted as well. Hmm. I remember I saw your slide just now. There was, uh, uh, you compare the different asset classes during the stagflation period in the 60s, 70s. Yep. And I saw, I remember I saw REITs was negative returns. <laughs> yep. So. Yeah. Yeah, so if that happens, I think because you get hit by both sides, right? Well, one is a uh, 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 financing charges, and the other right. hand is that your rental is coming down because people are right. not renting, tenants' occupancy is low, right? Yeah. So it's like a double whammy uh, for for rent. Correct, correct, correct. So yeah, so that's definitely something to be mindful about. Uh, not our base case scenario as yet, but uh, for those who are heavy in REITs, this is something to be to be careful about as well. 
Yeah, even to the individual it sucks, right? Because people are losing job and prices of food and work, everything is going up. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. And that's something that we have not actually experienced, or most of us, I would say, have not experienced it before. So because the last time it happened in the US, that was 50 years ago. So a lot of us probably would not be close to actually experiencing that. But potentially if prices were to be going up at like a 10% rate every year, you know, that's definitely a, a, a nightmare scenario. Huh? Yeah. Okay. So the other thing that you brought up was about China equities. You're saying that they are very cheap, especially the China tech one, right? So uh, I agree. I do think that China is really beaten down too much really. Okay. But of course, we also don't know the bottom, right? Whether whether you rebound from here or you go down further. Uh, but we we do agree that it is cheap enough to worth a look at, right? And uh, there's a question related to this. So uh, E is asking, is Lion OCBC Securities Hang Seng Tech Index ETF a good start for exposure to China tech stocks? What do you think? I think it's okay. It's one of those stocks that's listed in SGX. Uh, if I'm correct, am I right? Uh, Alvin? Yes, yes, yes. yes. It is, it is. So I think it's pretty easy to actually use that to uh, get started. And they basically compose of some of the largest blue chip tech companies in uh, Hong Kong as well as in China. So I guess that, you know, if they have already been bitten down quite a bit, I think now might be a time to potentially dip your toes in it slowly. I'm not saying all in at one shot, but, you know, that's, that's definitely something interesting and easy for Singaporean investors to actually get started on. Yeah, I, I, I think it is a relevant index because Hang Seng Tech Index has also been beaten down quite a fair bit because mm -hmm. of the, the exposure. Yeah, yeah, really and good. yeah I, I remember the names, uh, definitely your Alibaba, your Tencent, uh, Xiaomi, right? some of these uh, very familiar names. And if you are not very clear about uh, all these Chinese companies or you're not sure, not familiar with them, definitely buying an ETF uh, would give you the exposure without the need for you to do the anal analysis on individual stocks. So yeah, I agree that it is probably one of the good way to start to get exposure to China tech stock if you haven't already. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see what other question. That is a third question. What sector on SGX benefit from commodity rates, food and energy shortages? Ah, okay. So I, I think we kind of like cover it already, right? Um, um, uh, maybe, you know, for Ryston side, what do you what do you think that the to, the answer to this question? What sector or not share is benefit from commodities, rates, food, and energy shortages? I don't think there's any particular sector that really benefits or one particular sector uh, that really benefits from whatever that's happening right now in the market, lah, which is basically rising rates. Uh, rising rates, basically, we'll be looking at, of course, the banks. That's basically a beneficiary. But if you're talking about uh, commodity prices rising, then, of course, you know, those companies which are exposed to those kind of commodities uh, will be beneficiary of, of it. So just, I, I would say is that um, one, one thing I like to highlight, and this is a conversation that I had with Alvin just now as well, that in our Singapore context, there's not really a lot of um, basically big companies or I would say big energy companies, so to speak, not like the likes of your Exxon and whatnot. And whatever that is happening right now, pretty interesting, is that oil prices are rising quite fast. And historically, most of the time in this kind of environment, the blue chip companies, the blue chip oil and gas companies will be the first one that's jumping in and basically ramping up production. But... In today's context, they are actually avoiding, all right? They have actually kept uh, their promise of not going aggressive in terms of capex. They have kept their promise in terms of not going into, not going back into oil and gas, uh, focusing on ESG. And even in today's rising price, it actually benefits a lot of all this kind of uh, small caps, smaller to mid caps energy companies who are now no longer seeing that competition from the big boys. So that's something that is pretty interesting, all right? Uh, just to share with you guys, as well, that a lot of all this kind of uh, smaller cap companies like what Alvin have also shared, Joe Energy perhaps, um, they are not seeing a lot of competition from the bigger boys because those players are now avoiding this sector and preferring to stick to the greener energy path, even though the commodity prices actually does make sense for more production to be made. 
So we could be in an environment whereby if these big boys are not coming in, then these smaller players will be one that's ripping the benefits of it. But that also means that supply is not going to be coming on stream that quickly and the whole deficit scenario could potentially be lasting longer than expectation. Mm. And uh, I saw an interesting question about uh, from JJ about oil and gas. Uh, he or she said that the oil and gas prices are reaching new highs, but movement of oil and gas shares doesn't seem to move in tandem. How do we time the entry and exit for oil and gas shares? Uh, so I, I, I make a little bit of assumption here. So I, I, I do see a lot of oil and gas stocks actually go up in tandem with the oil and gas price, right? So I think, I assume the question comes from the angle for uh, oil and gas related stocks like Capital, uh, probably San Marine, right? Uh, where the prices haven't really kept pace with the oil and gas price. Okay, so uh, maybe I can answer this first, then then uh, Royston yeah, can sure. add in a bit. So my my view is probably because um capital is not hundred percent oil and gas play, right? It has property, it has real estate, you have a lot of other things, a conglomerate rather than just a pure uh, exploration kind of company. Yes, they do uh, oil rigs, all these kind of things. Um, uh, but even that, they are trying to sell it to San Marine. Right? And then on the other hand, San Marine, yes, it has more exposure to uh, uh, the oil and gas sector uh, uh, in that aspect, right? But it's again, it's not, they are not really the one that's selling the oil, you see. So they're just selling their equipment to the oil companies. So if, if, if the oil prices go up, they don't immediately reap it. So I think from the angle, the correlation with oil prices is not as strong as other energy companies that really are the one digging out the oil and sell them in the market. So those are the clear beneficiary. And I think that in Singapore, um, there isn't one company that is uh, exactly involved in that. That's my view. Royston, what do you have to say? I think you are exactly right. Uh, if you are talking about one company that might have some exposure to the upstream side, upstream side meaning those that is really digging oil and selling oil, so really beneficiary of high oil prices. I would say that the only one that I know of is potentially Rex. All right, that's one of the ah, smaller yeah, cap yeah, yeah, yeah. Rex that right? They, yeah. Put, they, they, they previously were just providing their solutions, right, their instruments, and then now they become a upstream player as well, so to speak. But other than that, I think what Alvin has said is uh, really makes a lot of sense. A lot of the bigger players like Keppel, Keppel is looking to divest its um, oil and gas business to Samcorp Marine, and for Samcorp Marine, it is not an upstream player, right, meaning that it does not benefit if directly if oil prices is high, because at the end of the day, they are the ones that is building all the equipments, selling the rigs, to intermediaries. So even if prices were to go up, if there's already an oversupply of all these rigs out there, which is what is happening right now, there's no, there's not going to be incremental demand for um, all these uh, customers going to Samcorp Marine and say, hey, I want to be, be building more rigs because in the very first place, there's already excess of all this and the big boys are not coming in at this current juncture as well. So unfortunately, that's the the, the set fate for uh, our, our blue chip place like uh, Sam Cobb Marine. It will take a while for them to restructure and, and get the new yes, yes. Uh, direction right, right? Correct. Okay, next question from Edward. He's asking that a lot of people think that real estate is good to hold in inflationary period, but unrising interest rate very negative for property. Very interesting question. Come, Royston, do you have any views on this? Um, generally, I would say um, the, the whole thinking is that in an inflationary environment, you should be holding on to hard assets, all right? Because hard assets generally, like, like real estates, uh, generally they are limited in terms of um, quantity. You're not able to just grow you know, uh, buildings all of a sudden or very short period of time. So there's limited quantity. And therefore, there's going to be value in it. So if demand remains pretty strong, that's where you're going to see higher value for your real estate, for your properties, for example, as well. So in that kind of scenario, yes, it does make sense to be buying uh, real estates and, and to hold to kind of like hedge against inflationary costs. But at the same point of time, the other dual effect is that if 
your property prices is not rising as fast as your mortgage rate or you did not lock in your mortgage rates, which uh, right now a lot of people are getting worried because they are saying, wow, the mortgage rate is really rising pretty quickly. Not too long ago, it was just at 1.1%. 1, 1. 1%. I'm able to fix it for three years. Now, all of a sudden, it's going to be at 1.6%, 1.8%. You know, so if you are feeling that impact, uh, then definitely it's going to hit you a lot more. Lah. So that's basically what uh, what my thinking is with regards to properties. All right, uh, definitely interest rate rising is going to taper some of the demand for real estates because it's not going to be as affordable for most people when the mortgage rate r- r- rises from 1% to 2-3%. I mean, we are so comfortable with uh, mortgage rates at 1% for the longest of time, but the norm has always been at two, three, even 4% if you were to stretch out that horizon, right? But I mean, most of us have been only exposed to mortgage rates at 1%. So the reality is that we need to be comfortable that the normalized rates should be somewhere around 3%. And if that's not something that you're able to accept or, you know, your finances are not able to accept, you know, that's where, you know, uh, that there could be a problem now. So my, my view is about this, uh, it sounds contradictory, right? Real estate should go up in value during inflationary period because it's a hard asset. And at the same time, uh, interest rate going up would cause financing charges to be much higher, mortgage loan to be much higher and deter demand. So I think how to look at it, right, is that uh, they will eventually arrive to an equilibrium. Okay, so in a sense that the people who are holding on to real estate would start to see to enjoy that kind of uh, valuation gains, right? Then um, those who are actually buying properties, uh, especially for investments, they will be more sensitive to the uh, interest rate because if they overstretch themselves and the interest rate keep going up, they may lose the affordability. So I think at the end of the day, there will be some equilibrium that will be reached. But in general, uh, uh, property prices should go up in terms of valuation, but it doesn't mean that the transactions for property will go up okay, or the demand will go up. So I do think that it is a separate thing and uh, it would come to an equilibrium that uh, it will not be something that is super overheated the way I see it. Right? So as the rates are rising, uh, I don't think the buying activity will be growing very, very fast. Uh, it's still growing even at this point in time, but if rates rise further, I think it will deter the demand further. Right. Okay, um, next question from Vince. Is that better put money in bond than aim recovery stock? Okay, so basically he's asking should... Should people put money in bond than to buy stocks, right? Rather than say negative bonds. So <laughs> you want to elaborate on that? I'm genuinely negative on bonds. I mean, because we are not actually making, if, if inflation and for Singapore, the inflation rate right now is probably around 4%, 4 plus percent. All right. And it seems like it's going to trend higher. And that means that if you are putting uh, your money into a, a bond asset that is generating you 1%, 2%, it's basically negative you. That means you're losing money from actually putting money in, in, in bond assets. So that's not something that I would, I would say advice. But of course, there's still going to be a lot of uh, people who are more conservative and definitely looking to chase for bond products that is basically offering them 2 3%, all right, which is very high in the low interest rate environment. But if we are looking at an environment whereby interest rate is rising, there's going to be a lot more opportunities to be putting in in higher yielding asset classes moving forward as well. So to me, I still don't think, you know, bonds is a uh, safe asset class also. to I mean, it's safe generally in that sense. You probably will not lose your capital if you are putting in into government debt bonds, etc. But uh, in terms of the yield, the real yield that you're getting is actually negative, so to speak. So you're actually losing some of our money. It's just like putting money into the bank uh, as well. Huh? So, so that's something which uh, I'm mindful about. So I'm not sure about what your thoughts are, Alvin. Yeah. So, so what Ryzen is saying that if let's say the, the inflation rate is 3%, it rises to 3% and the bond is paying 2%, you're actually losing 1%, right? So it's actually negative for you. Uh, my view is that uh, I think some people come in the point of view that it's more about capital preservation than to uh, make a higher return on, on the capital itself lah, during this uncertain time. So I do understand that some people, maybe they're more risk adverse and they are considering bonds. So if that's the case, I do think that uh, from a capital preservation perspective, uh, getting to short-term bonds makes more sense, right? Mm-hmm. They are less sensitive mm-hmm. to interest rate rises. Um, uh, at least, you know, you are able to uh, switch out. 
and uh, you know even SSB, Singapore Savings Bond, all these, uh, uh, they are not, they are, they are not, uh, how to say, uh, uh, your your cap your your par value doesn't go down, right? As the interest rate go up, so that could also be one of the considerations that you can have, lah. So I do think that there are safe options if you are coming from a capital preservation perspective. But I agree with Royston that. Um, it's very likely that your bond price that you buy is going to fall if interest rate goes up. But if you hold under maturity, you get a capital projection. But his point is that during this whole period, you might be experiencing uh, lower purchasing power <laughs> because of uh, negative rates. Uh. Okay, so that's uh, probably the last question. I think our times is about going to go up. I think the last question is the most relevant for this. From Lee, to both speaker, what is the one element that you think is the most important to have in a portfolio for this year? Oh. Why not you start first? <laughs> I start first. Okay, I, I think it's just to put things in context, right? So it depends on what your portfolio already have. Okay, if, if let's say you are already very heavy commodities, then I say, wow, the most important thing to have is commodity and because of the, the, the rising inflation and things like that. And then to you, it's not relevant because you're already exposed to it. So I would say that it really depends on uh, what you lack at this point in time because I believe in more uh, diversification than less uh, because there are different sectors that's always in play in a different uh, economic environment. So now there are a few sectors that I think people should look at, right? Uh, commodities, finance, consumer staples, uh, probably some recovery plays in those uh, uh, hospitality sector. So I do think that these are all valid plays. Um, um, it depends on what you already have and what you not have. Yeah, so that's my answer. Royston, to you. For me, it's just uh, simple. To me, if you ask me just one particular sector that I like and I think that there's going to be good potential, whether or not we are looking at an environment which is potentially bearish or one which you know is a recovery play, I would still think that commodities is one area. But like what Alvin said today, if you are really heavily exposed to that sector, then of course you shouldn't be adding more to your uh, portfolio size. Lah. But if you are looking to put in one particular sector which you think is going to be resilient moving forward, then definitely uh, some, some form of commodities is going to be really useful in helping you to hedge against the different scenarios that we have highlighted today. Hey man, I think our time's up and yep. let's hand it over to Edward. Yes, thank you, Edward. Thank you very much, Alvin and Royston. Wow, that was really very comprehensive and very educational as well. I think they managed to cover really a very wide, very broad swath of topics. So thank you again to the two of them. 